All right, well, hey, everyone, welcome or welcome back to the channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you are here today. I have a very special guest here with me today, Father Josiah Trenum, and I am so excited for you to get to hear this interview. Father Josiah is a native of Southern California and attended Westminster Seminary, California, receiving his MDiv in 1992 while studying under some of the most influential teachers in the Reformed tradition, including R.C. Sproul. In 1993, he was ordained to the Holy Priesthood of the Orthodox Church, and in 2004, he was awarded a PhD in theology from the University of Durham, England. Father Josiah has published numerous articles and two books, including this one, Rock and Sand, which we will be talking about a little bit today, and is also the founder of Patristic Nectar Publications, a nonprofit ministry. His weekly homilies are available on his podcast, The Arena, produced by Ancient Faith Radio. His reflections are also available on YouTube under Patristic Nectar Films. Father Josiah has been married to his wife, Catherine Christie, since 1988, and together they have 10 children, including, I just found out, two grandchildren and a third on the way. Is that correct? It's correct. Thank God. Wonderful. Well, Father Josiah, thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be with you, Austin. Thank you. So if people were listening closely there, they might have noticed something interesting. In 1992, you graduate from Westminster Seminary in California, which is a bastion of Reformed Protestant thought, if people aren't familiar with it. And then just a year later, in 1993, you're ordained to the priesthood in the Orthodox Church. Now, I've listened to some other interviews that I'll link down below, including the wonderful interview you did with Michael Lofton, and you described that you went into Westminster a Presbyterian, you came out not quite a Presbyterian, and in a year, you were an Orthodox priest. Can you break that down a little bit and explain how that happened? Sure, sure. I was uh, born and raised in Southern California as a Presbyterian. Uh, I was baptized at Glendale Presbyterian Church as an infant. When I was uh, eight years old, I visited the Orthodox Church for my very first time. I had a good buddy uh, named Paul, who was a Greek, a Greek Orthodox, he and his family. And we used to play baseball together. And on some weekends, I would spend the night at his house. And on some weekends, he would spend the night at my house. And when I was with him, I would go to his Orthodox Church. And when he was with me, he would come to the Presbyterian Church. And when I was eight, I, I participated in the liturgy there. I was completely confused. It was very unlike my Presbyterian church. I was fascinated. I had a, a marvelous actual spiritual experience there. Uh, at the end of the service, the Orthodox go up and, and receive a blessing from the priest mm -hmm. who was serving the liturgy and are given a little blessed bread. And I went up and I kissed the priest's hand and just felt like lightning bolts were shooting out of my mouth. It was a completely surreal experience. I, remember, mm -hmm. I can see even now the sun was coming in uh, as I was walking down the center aisle to leave the church, and I, I still see it. Ten years later, I'm 18 years old, and I am a student at uh, Westmont College, uh, which uh, is a sister school of Wheaton in Santa Barbara. And I meet my wife on the first day of her first year. Uh, of so I helped her uh, carry her, her luggage in uh, to the dorm. It was a, a wise move, evidently. <laughs> and uh, she was the youngest of six from a, a Methodist family. And her oldest brother, uh, who had gone off to Wheaton, had become Orthodox. Uh, he was at Wheaton. He, had, he was studying under a professor who's, who's now uh, passed on, Dr. Robert Weber is his name, God rest his soul. Oh, yes. But he taught, he taught a lot about worship, and he was a great admirer of Orthodox liturgy. And he had his students go to the Orthodox church for, for, to experience a liturgy. And he went and uh, basically never came back, ended up marrying a Russian girl, becoming a, an Orthodox Christian and a dentist. And he began to send me materials uh, as I was dating his sister. He did not want his sister uh, marrying an, uh, a Calvinist. <laughs> and I was convinced I was going to bring him to the Reformed faith. And so we had quite a lively discussion for some years. Um, Catherine and I were married in college, and we began to visit uh, local churches, really just to, to understand him better and uh, to be able to communicate. And I uh, was immediately attracted, immediately attracted to the Orthodox faith. We began to attend Vesper services on Saturday nights on a regular basis. I was completely overwhelmed with the centrality of Scripture in the services, listening to so much of the Old Testament and the Psalms read and chanted. 
uh, it was it was deeply moving for me. And that began a, a dialogue that I had, a very formal dialogue between my Reformed faith and orthodoxy. And it continued through college uh, as I began to read patristic works and uh, ortho contemporary orthodox literature. When I went to seminary, I naturally went to a Presbyterian seminary. And uh, I, I started at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, and the connection there was, was R.C. Sproul. This was just at the time that he was trying to open a new campus in Orlando, Florida. It was a credible experience. But I, I, in all three years of uh, doing my MDiv, which I completed at Westminster West here because I wanted to come back to my home state, uh, I, I did independent studies with various professors on areas that I was uh, out of accord with orthodoxy. So, uh, for okay. instance, I, I did an independent study with the uh, late Dr. Edmund Clowney, who's kind of the most famous Presbyterian Reformed ecclesiologist, on the subject of bishops. Um, I corresponded with J.I. Packer about the subject of bishops. So it's not as though I, I graduated from seminary and then just, boom, I, I joined the, the Orthodox Church. I was visiting Orthodox churches and seriously thinking about the differences between my Reformed faith and the Orthodox faith. And through that process, I gradually began to accept uh, Orthodox teachings. I knew that when my last year of seminary, I knew that I would not be able to be ordained uh, in the Presbyterian Church. I had uh, I had moved past that. So, but I wasn't quite confident that uh, that I was ready to be Orthodox. And so I, together with a number of, of, of friends who were in a similar position, approached the Reformed Episcopal Church, uh, which, which seemed to be a bridge for me. I communicated very cl clearly to the bishop at that time. His name was Royal Grote. He just passed away, actually, last year. Uh, bishop Grote, I wrote him a letter, and I said, look, I, I, I'm very interested in becoming an Orthodox Christian. I no longer can, become a, can, can be a Presbyterian. I believe in bishops. You're a bishop. Could you accept me? And my family, even if in a year I, I come to resolve that I need to become Orthodox. And he was so gracious. He said, absolutely. Uh, if that happens, I, I will accept you. If that happens, I'll even write you a letter of reference to the Orthodox bishop. And in fact, that's what happened. Uh, I became re Reformed Episcopal for a little more than a year. Uh, and then I informed him that I wanted to become Orthodox. And he was very gracious and wrote a pastoral letter putting me basically in the care of the local Orthodox bishop uh, and beginning my catechism as an Orthodox Christian. Wow, that's quite the journey. And thank you for sharing so much of that. I can just imagine some of my friends that I have here at Moody that I know are attending Orthodox churches most Sundays or investigating all of this. And I feel like I'm getting to see some of that journey in, in slow motion in them. And so it'll be interesting to see where they end up. And I know many people on my channel are feeling as though they're they're experiencing that journey wherever um, that, that leads for myself. But I, I know many of, so I, we mentioned this before, but the majority of my audience happens to be Catholic, which is very interesting as an evangelical. I'm sure they're going to want to hear, they, I mean, they heard you say bishops and they like, they're saying, yeah, like this is the stuff we investigate too. What did you find lacking in Catholicism that eventually led you to orthodoxy? Hmm. Well, um, First, before I say what I found lacking, let, let me just say that I uh, have many beloved Catholic friends, and I have uh, been exceedingly blessed by the leadership of Roman Catholic Christians uh, in many avenues of ministry in, in the United States that I find of great import. So the, the leadership uh, in the pro-life movement, which is of great concern to me, that the Roman Catholic Church provides is just uh, second to none. Uh, the leadership in the defense of the family and the promotion of religious liberty. Uh, I, I am deeply, deeply grateful for the Roman Catholic witness uh, in these areas. And for most of church history, to be Catholic was to be Orthodox, and to be Orthodox was to be Catholic. Uh, so we have, uh, unlike the relationship between the Orthodox Church and the Protestant communion, uh, we have an organic history. Uh, we though we have had a, a terrible schism and have suffered terrible consequences from that schism, with the Roman Catholic Church, we have a common familial bond that spans the majority of Christian history. Uh, so I, I just want to say that up front before I, I say a few words about um, our differences and, and an Orthodox perspective on 
why we're separated today. I would say that uh, my, me personally, uh, I was very interested in the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, as a, a Reformed person who was exploring uh, early church history and trying to, to ask the question if I would have been an acceptable believer to the early Christians, mm -hmm. uh, I, I explored uh, Roman Catholicism as, as well. And I'd say really to comment on why I didn't become Catholic, I'd have to say that there's really two two strata to, to understand the, the answer to that. The first is the strata on the ground, like what's really happening on the ground uh, in, uh, in the Catholic Church in America and in the West in general. And the second is the higher level, which is the theological level. But let me start at the ground first. Um, I had a tremendous disconnect. One of the greatest areas of dissatisfaction in my Protestant experience was the was the was was Sunday. Uh, the actual worship service was so uh, unsatisfying to me, so out of accord with my sense of of how God was approached in the Scriptures in the Old Covenant, um, and in what I was learning about church history and the centrality of the Eucharist and the reverence that's involved in traditional Christian worship. It was so far from my lived, reformed experience. And that wasn't just here in, in, in Southern California. That was also in seminary milieus. And usually there's a, there's a level of intensity and seriousness around seminary communities. And I, at Reformed Seminary in Jackson, in Reformed Seminary in Orlando, and at Westminster Seminary in San Diego, I was members and very active in, in Reformed churches in all those places. And it was a great grief to me that I found the worship there also very dissatisfying. So when I, with that background, um, and with my experience of, of Orthodox services uh, over the years since I was young, and then it, since I was in college, I was very drawn by the deep reverence and fear of God that appears in, in Orthodox services and worship services, especially the emphasis upon theology. Uh, the, mm -hmm. tr the Holy Trinity is front and center in all prayer in the Orthodox Church. And in my Reformed experience, it was the prayers were very thin, often just directed to Jesus. They were not reg regularly Trinitarian prayers. Um, and when I began to explore Catholicism as a possible option for myself, I found on the ground not, not much difference between my Protestant experience and the post-Vatican II Novus Ordo, banjo playing, uh, happy slappy Catholic masses. I just, I read a book um, by an incredible Catholic uh, priest musician. Uh, he, he's written a number of books. Um, see if I can remember his name. Uh, what, the, the title of the book is Why Catholics Cannot Sing. And he also wrote another book on architecture called Where Have You Gone, Michelangelo? Uh, and, and this Catholic priest uh, forgive me for, for getting old and forgetting his name. Uh, this Catholic priest just pointed out the radical departure from traditional worship and the sacred arts of music and architecture that had, had been taking place in the Catholic Church since, the Vati since Vatican II in the 60s. And uh, that was very disappointing for me. So just on the ground. Plus, I was in Southern California, and Southern California for decades was the province of uh, Cardinal Roger Mahoney. Cardinal Roger Mahoney is a heretic and a corrupt bishop. Uh, he is. He held many conferences in which the most radical forms of aberrant theology, like denying the resurrection, professors would come and say this. It, it was just terrible. And I had a number of Catholic friends, uh, including a, a dear Catholic priest friend, who uh, I was interacting with and as I was exploring Catholicism, who was just... Uh, traumatized by his own relationship to Cardinal Mahoney. In fact, he ended up having his faculties for serving the Mass removed from Cardinal Mahoney, and he actually had to leave. He went to Mexico uh, in mm -hmm. order to be under a more uh, traditionally minded uh, Roman Catholic bishop. So when I was exploring, uh, uh, it wasn't just that issue of the theological differences between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. It was also the matter that on the ground, the Catholic Church is in complete disarray. Uh, it's it's really a, it's a tragic scenario, uh, and many many Catholics simply uh, are what we would call maybe cafeteria Catholics, right? They they're going through the calf and they're taking what they want from the Catholic faith and rejecting others. 
that that kind of radical individualism seemed to me very much like my Protestant experience. And I did not want that. I had no interest in going through the catharsis of leaving my my Protestant faith only to get into a Catholic milieu in which I was going to be facing the exact same issues. Catholics who really weren't Catholic or were embarrassed of traditional Catholic teaching. On the theological level, uh, it, the, the issues really are, were that I was, I was um, deeply concerned that my Reformed faith had changed so much in 500 years that it would not be able to resist the, the currents of secular culture such that my own children, I had, when I converted, I had two small sons at the time. My, they're 30, almost 31 and 29 now, but they were at that time three and one. And I was concerned that the Presbyterian Church I knew and experienced would not even exist when they were adults. Uh, and that I would have invested my life with them uh, in a tradition that was so weak that it was changing. In fact, uh, I would say that in many ways, that's the case, uh, as I've watched it over this amount of time. So I was very worried about this uh, this, the, the changes. I wanted to find what Jude described in his epistle as the faith once delivered to the saints. And the faith that Paul called the pillar and the foundation of the truth, right? He, this is how Paul describes the church. And I knew that Jesus had made incredible promises to his church to build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so I really tested uh, orthodoxy and Catholicism based upon this question. Who has not changed? Who has been able to weather uh, and, and, and maintained, uh, maintained a, a semblance, you know, the core of the Christian faith without much change? And most of the differences, all of the differences on principle between orthodoxy and Catholicism are dogmas that the Catholic Church has articulated of late. So, for instance, uh, the fundamental dogmatic difference between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church is a doctrine with regards to the Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian doctrine called the Filioque. And the Filioque was uh, first uh, uh, propagated by the popes in about 1009. Uh, it had appeared in the West uh, in the 500s in Spain, uh, but the pope had suppressed it. Uh, in, uh, uh, and under Charlemagne in 800, it, uh, the Carolingian theologians tried to promote it again as a way of uh, separating themselves from the, the Byzantine emperor and from the Orthodox East. They tried to say, in fact, that the Filioque was originally in the creed and that we took it out. <laughs> that was actually common Catholic apologetics for a long time. Um, yeah. But the Pope suppressed that. As a matter of fact, at the time that that was happening, he even had the creed, the Nicene Creed, written in its original Greek and the original Latin translation, and he had those plaques affixed to the doors of St. Peter's to show what the faith was. Uh, and he was very clear at the time that no pope had the authority to change the creed because the creed belonged to the whole church and was established in ecumenical councils. Uh, 200 years later, uh, the papacy had developed to such a degree that that whole orientation towards authority in the church and the supremacy of, this, of the ecumenical councils had changed. So now in the Catholic West in the 11th century, their canon law books, instead of starting with the apostolic fathers, uh, apostolic canons, and then the ecumenical council canons, immediately began to put papal canons at the head of their canon list, as though the Pope's rulings were more important in the ecumenical councils. And that was expressed in the change in the creed, which took place in the 11th century, by adding filioque to the third paragraph of the creed on the Holy Spirit. When that happened, the ecumenical patriarch dropped the Pope from his diptychs, from his prayer list, which is a sign that he's fallen out of the Orthodox or Catholic faith, and that something needs to be done to fix this. It's not saying that he won't return or won't be corrected, but uh, unfortunately that hasn't been the case. Uh, the filioque remains uh, a Catholic dogma. Uh, so that was the first big dogmatic difference. The second was uh, that that was essentially a, a, a deal breaker with the Orthodox East was the concept of Petrine authority, which reached a climax uh, at the first Vatican Council in 1870 with the declaration of papal infallibility. This concept of, uh, of the Pope uh, being the one who uh, is superior over all the other bishops. I mean, today the Pope literally appoints personally every bishop 
uh, in every land in the Catholic world. This is uh, absolutely anathema to the Orthodox understanding of the Church and authority. So those two issues, if a Catholic becomes Orthodox, uh, and there are many, many Roman Catholics who are becoming Orthodox constantly in my own parish, I, I have at least maybe, I would say 200 uh, wow. in my own parish over the last 20 years who have become uh, Orthodox, and they have to publicly renounce those two dogmas. They have to publicly renounce the filioque, and they have to publicly renounce papal infallibility in order to become Orthodox. And those, those, both of those dogmas, uh, and there's, it's not that those aren't the only ones. The dogma of purgatory, of creating grace, the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary. I mean, these are issues as well, but they're not of the of the significance of those two. Wow. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to link in the description to, you gave a wonderful talk, and I think it's the most popular video on patristic nectar films on an orthodox perspective on Roman Catholicism. So if you're interested, and in, I think that's over an hour long, if you want to hear more of Father Josiah on that, you can go ahead and check that out as well. But uh, along those lines, so you've given a lot of the the things that, that kept you from Catholicism and made you see orthodoxy as, as the fullness of the faith. Today, I know, at least in the comment sections of my videos, a lot of people make a, a lot of just cries out for, for reunification between the East and the West. And you talk about this a little in that video. But you say, you know, these are the, the two main things, papal infallibility and the filioque. But you also mention that perhaps people are looking at this as though it's much easier than it actually would be, that if we could just somehow fix those two things, it would magically reunite the churches. But it seems that you've said it's not quite that simple. Perhaps, what are, what are people missing when they talk about reunification lightly? That's a great question, Austin. Uh, I would say that uh, what they're doing is they're taking an intellectual um, approach to faith and projecting it on onto the issue of uh, Orthodox Catholic relations. Uh, uh, of course, there, there is nothing that has saddened the church more than the Great Schism. In, in my opinion, the Great Schism is the, is the most terrible interior reality that's ever taken place in the life of the church. I would say that the saddest exterior reality uh, is the rise of Islam uh, in the seventh century especially that was just a decimating century for uh, the church uh, at the hands of Islam. Uh, and and sec the, the rise of militant secularism, as we've seen it in the 20th century and continuing into the 21st century, is, a, is strongly competing for the <laughs> greatest catastrophe uh, in relationship to the church and in exterior relationships. Uh, but I would just say that the idea that... Uh, 800 years of separation could be solved if we just had the Pope and the ecumenical patriarch declare it to be so. Uh, that's taking a Western concept and maybe a papal concept uh, and um, uh, implying it to us. There, there is no equivalent to the Pope in the Orthodox world. We have a much more organic concept of how the faith is articulated and defended that involves all the bishops including the patriarchs, but all the bishops and the clergy and the people. Uh, and so there, there were many times when, uh, or at least two significant times in the 13th century uh, at the Council of Lyon and in the 15th century at the False Reunion Council of Ferrara, Florence, where uh, Orthodox bishops tried to reunite with uh, the papacy and even many of them signed documents. But when they got back to their home sees, um, their people simply met them at the boat, tied them up, and threw them into the Bosphorus to their deaths. So, the, wow. the, yeah, the idea that uh, somehow, you know, we have the ecumenical patriarch or some other patriarch can just say it is so, and it's going to be, that's just not the case. So but that's a huge difference. Um, and we, we, I would add on to that as well, the whole concept of academia the Catholic faith is a, is a very rationalistic faith. Uh, one of the great differences is that, that, that has followed the schism is the very definition of what a theologian is in the East and West is, is just radically different. Uh, the academic theology has almost no place in the Orthodox world. In fact, I would say, and of course I'm speaking as an academic theologian. I mean, I, I'm, I have a terminal degree in theology. I did it 
not because I think it, it means much. It was a great opportunity for me to dedicate, to dedicate time that as a pastor I would not be able to justify investing in. Um, but the idea that somehow PhDs know the faith and can articulate the faith, Orthodox people just don't buy that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, that America, it's full of Orthodox Christians who have PhDs in theology, who think they know things and are, are smarter than the church. And no one's listening to them but other academic theologians. So th this is not a big deal in the Orthodox Church, whereas in the West, uh, a theologian uh, is, is really uh, a very different uh, phenomenon. Um, the, the concept of university, the use of reason, the place of Aristotle, the whole um, scholastic approach, uh, which is, is still very, very big in the Catholic world, is, is much less so uh, in the Orthodox East. So there's going to be, there's a certain suspicion in the Orthodox world universally about these high-level academic dialogues nationally and international between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, a lot of Orthodox are like, well, what's that and what do we care? Uh, that, that attitude. And I think that's very different than in the West. Yeah, that's really interesting that you bring that up, the fundamental difference that you talked about as far as, as though it could come just top down that the ecumenical patriarch and the Pope would sign some papers and then it would happen. And I was just reading, and this is probably a bit far afield, but I was reading uh, The Primacy of Peter, edited by Jay Meyendorf and with Father Schmemann and others. And they were talking about the fundamental differences in approaching the church as a whole as in the West, kind of this universal church made up of parts and whole versus a Eucharistic um, communion, which I think is just really interesting. And perhaps if people want to learn more about that, that's something they could look into. But I I think that's going to be a helpful thing, the way you've said that it's not going to be something that just happens top down like that. Yeah, I don't think so. That doesn't mean that I'm not interested. I, I as an Orthodox believer, I very much have a great desire for uh, Roman Catholicism, especially, and Protestantism to humble themselves um, and accept the faith uh, that that bound all Christians together when all Christians were together, uh, and to give up in the Catholic Church the, the post schism additions and in the Protestant world uh, the confessions of faith that are even more recent. Uh, I, I'm very enthused for that um, to happen, and the idea of that we that we wouldn't because of our dogmatic insistence that that has to be by embracing the faith that was confessed by Christians in the first millennium, that we, that means we, we're not interested. That's not the case. That's really not the case. As a matter of fact, Orthodox, Orthodox Christianity does not practice open communion. So we, we don't invite Roman Catholics and Protestants to the chalice in our divine liturgies. And one of the reasons that we do, do that, it's not because we disdain them, one of the reasons that we do that is because we want that to provoke the discussion about why we're separated to facilitate a return to the faith that used to bind us. Uh, and if we, of course, if we shared the chalice with non-Orthodox believers, if you have the chalice, you have everything. Uh, and there, there's no impetus to make any correction of, uh, at all. Uh, we then would trivialize the differences between us as though they're just personal theological opinions that we can feel free to hold. Uh, but that's not what we think they are. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. My light went out there. But you mentioned that, so the Great Schism is just the, the most lamentable thing in the history of Christianity. And I don't know if you would call this the second most, but you did talk about just the, the pain of the Protestant Reformation as well, and that you would love to see your pro, the Protestants come back to what you see as the faith once delivered to the saints. So at the time of recording this, we're just, I believe, two days away from Reformation Day, and we are now 503 years from the Protestant Reformation in 1517. And you've written actually on this subject in your book, Rock and Sand, an Orthodox Appraisal of the Protestant Reformers in Their Teachings. I would be interested to start, and you go over this in the book, and I'll link this, and I would really recommend, I had a great time reading through this, but at, at like the 30,000 foot level, what do you see the Protestant reformers getting right, and where did they go wrong? Well, that's a wonderful question, and I'd like to start with 
the same way that I did when you asked me to speak a little bit about our differences with, with Roman Catholicism by simply affirming uh, all of the incredible contributions uh, that the Protestant Christian faith has made to my life and to the United States. Um, pro uh, in, in many, many areas, I view Protestant Christians as extremely exemplary and uh, leading uh, Christians in many ways. Their, their incredible commitment to missions and to bringing the good news of our Savior's uh, triumph over death and his sacred death for the forgiveness of the entire human race, uh, the, the Protestants are just uh, incredibly zealous, especially evangelicals. Um, and, I, and I deeply revere that concern for the salvation of, of, of all non-Christians. This is an absolutely orthodox mentality. St. John Chrysostom, for instance, the greatest preacher in the history of the church, said that a Christian who is not concerned about the salvation of his neighbor is not a Christian. Hmm. Uh, and to see, uh, to see the great zeal of Protestant uh, mission work is uh, extremely encouraging. And also the commitment to Scripture, the devotion to translating the Scriptures uh, and producing them at very high levels, uh, all of the Greek texts, for instance, that I use in, in my own study are all produced by Protestant scholarship. And many of the commentaries, fantastic commentaries that I have on my shelf are, are done by, by Protestant scholars who are deeply committed to uh, the scriptures. And so I, I just want to say my, my critique, please uh, don't, I don't want any of your listeners to think that uh, I'm not appreciating uh, many, many beautiful things. And in my own upbringing, uh, you know, I was for 25 years, the first 25 years of my life, which is now, uh, as I get older, a minority of my life. But uh, for many, for many interviews I've been, done over the years, it was a majority of my life. I'm 53 now. But uh, I, I had so many touches and so much encouragement. Um, my, my love for God was sparked uh, by Protestant Christians who loved me and wanted to disciple me. Um, I had an incredible man, a uh, young pastor, Protestant pastor, when I was in college, who taught me to memorize scripture. Uh, I mean, I just can't imagine what my life would be like uh, without him in my life. Um, yeah. my, my late mother-in-law, my wife's mother, uh, the, the most gracious, God-loving person uh, that's ever, ever touched me uh, was a Methodist. And so I'm, uh, I'm deeply appreciative. I, I would say that the Protestant Reformation, if we're going to talk about Luther to start, which seems appropriate, uh, Luther had a, a great sense that many things were wrong. He was agitating against developments in the Catholic West, that many of which were shared by uh, the Orthodox East. As a matter of fact, when Cardinal Cajetan first uh, called Luther to his first heresy trial, when he was on trial, he, one of the things he said is, uh, I stand with the Orthodox. Now, he didn't really know what he was saying because he didn't have great lines of communication. He did develop those. His, his dear you know, spiritual brother and, uh, I should say, the one who tamed him to make him more acceptable to popular, Philip Melanchthon, he did, in fact, correspond with the Orthodox East. In fact, ecumenical patriarch sent one of his scholarly deacons to, and lived. That, deacon, that Greek deacon came and lived with Melanchthon for over a year. And they collaborated theologically a lot, and it began a theological correspondence between the Lutheran theologians and the ecumenical patriarch that went on for over 100 years, uh, in, in which the Protestant theologians addressed the ecumenical patriarch as their spiritual father in Christ. And the ecumenical patriarch wrote back to them and, and called them his sons. Um, so it, it began very positively. They sent, for instance, the Lutheran Confession of Faith to the ecumenical patriarch, and they asked him to critique it. And this is a good window through which you can perceive the initial orthodox praise of some of the aspects of Protestantism and critique of some of the aspects yes. of Protestantism. Uh, so, for instance, the, the paragraph uh, in the Lutheran statement on purgatory, which attacked purgatory as a heresy, left untouched by the ecumenical patriarch. I mean, he was just saying, you got that right. We, you, this is the or, yeah. This is the orthodox mind. Uh, we don't believe in, in purgatory either. Um, 
And if you wanted to know more about that, you could read the the sermons against purgatory that were delivered by St. Mark of Ephesus in the 15th century. He was a participant uh, in the uh, false reunion council of Ferrara, Florence. Hmm. And he wrote a number, he defended the Orthodox teaching on the afterlife there and wrote a number of sermons on that, which is a very good source to find the Orthodox mind about purgatory. Because we also don't, don't hold the Protestant idea that you die and instantaneously you're in paradise, like one second later. Um, so you could see in that correspondence between the ecumenical patriarch and the Lutheran theologians some very good avenues. Uh, some of the some of the weaknesses. Uh, so a, a criticism of the papacy and the and the the emphasis upon the temporal, uh, the idea of the pope having soldiers, the whole conflation between the earthly kingdom and that being under the guise of uh, ecclesiastical or spiritual leaders is something very not the orthodox way. Uh, and so Luther's strong critique of that uh, was appreciated by the Orthodox East. Uh, his emphasis uh, on an ecclesiology uh, that was early um, and, and, and not something that was post-Carolingian was also very appreciated by the ecumenical patriarch. Where, where we were uncomfortable, what his, his affirmation of justification by faith alone is something that the ecumenical patriarch critiqued very heavily. And he, the, the, the Orthodox were, were affirming that, the, that there is justification by faith, but not faith alone. Uh, okay. we, didn't have a, we didn't have a full-blown concept of uh, works theology that, uh, and an undergirding of how to understand justification by faith through works that the Latin West had. Uh, uh, so he, he was... The Orthodox East was, were, we were going in between Luther and the papacy, suggesting that there was a third way to understand okay. justification, for instance. Um, we were very uncomfortable with uh, the, the crass nature, for instance, of indulgences and the way that indulgences were being used by, uh, the, Roman, by the Roman Catholic authorities is something that we, we didn't appreciate at all. But Luther, uh, he, we, we do think Luther threw out the baby with the bathwater on numerous points. Uh, his affirmation of justification, the way he did it, by literally rewriting scripture. In his German Bible, he actually put the word alone uh, into the biblical text, which it's just not there. In fact, the only place it says alone is in James 2, when James insists it's not just, we're not justified by faith alone. So... That was a real stretch on Luther's part uh, that wasn't appreciated by, by the Orthodox East. The, unfortunately, the Protestants struck in their, in their reaction against an, an overly earthly uh, and made up Roman Catholic ecclesiology. They struck down, all the Protestant reformers universally struck down the four marks of the church that are articulated in the fourth paragraph of the creed. So instead of saying that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, all the reformers, in contradistinction to each other, uh, wrote, made up new marks of the church. So, for instance, John Calvin said that marks of the church is wherever the word of God is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly ministered. I mean, that completely begs the question. How do you know when the word of God is rightly preached and what are the sacraments that are supposed to be right, rightly administered? Um, and so be because of that striking uh, to, the, to the connection, breaking all necessity to have a tangible apostolic succession, uh, which is what... Uh, all of the Protestant reformers, even the Anglicans, did. Uh, they they severed their ability to be judged by the traditional historical church. So from the Orthodox perspective, the weakest link, the biggest mistake that the Protestants made was to break with traditional uh, church teaching on what the church herself is. And as soon as that happened, there was no controlling her from uh from the Protestant movement becoming independent churches, which is something Luther said he did not want to do. Uh, it happened during his lifetime, so he did recognize it. He said, he said, they're now calling themselves Lutherans after me. I didn't want this, but I have to accept it. So, uh, and of course, that has led to a, an incessant schismatic nature in the Protestant movement uh, that is renewed generation after generation. I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of Protestant denominations registered with the U.S. government in Currently, and new ones are being registered every week, all who have separate statements of faith 
and think that they represent true biblical Christianity. Yeah, well, that, that's a great summary. And if people are interested in more on your thoughts on the Reformation, there is plenty in this wonderful book. I, I wanted to bring up a, a quote that you, I believe it was in your interview with Kevin Allen, which just as an aside, could be a masterclass on how to interview. That was a brilliant interview he did on this book. But you mentioned that the Achilles heel of Protestantism is its ecclesiology. And I think we do see that really splintering off. And I think in a way that splintering is related to this idea of sola scriptura that I want to get into. And in your book as well, you wrote this, Evangelicalism is no stronghold itself of traditional Christian theology. It floats naively in an ocean of theological relativism with no secure anchor, having cut its tra- having cut its connection to holy tradition. So could you explain to me on an orthodox perspective, and perhaps we'll do a bit of a speed round here to uh, respect your time on orthodox theology, but the, the relationship between scripture and tradition and where did sola scriptura go wrong with that? Uh, That's a great question. The orthodox concept of tradition, what we call paradosis, includes scripture. So what tradition is, is the life of the church inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the kingdom of God on the earth. And it embraces, and it has an expression in many ways. Its chief expression is in the divinely inspired words of scripture. But it also expresses itself in the liturgy. Uh, in the sacred texts of the liturgical tradition, uh, which provide for us really the heart and content of our faith. We have a a patristic dictum that we follow, lex orandi, lex credendi, right? The rule of prayer is the rule of faith, that we believe what we pray, and we pray what we believe. So if anyone wants to know what the Orthodox think, they just need to come to services. And if they want to find out what we think about the Incarnation, come to our Christmas service. If you want to find out what we think about the cross, come to our Great and Holy Friday service. If you want to know what we think about the resurrection, come any Sunday, because every Sunday is dedicated to the resurrection, but especially Holy Pascha. If you want to know what we think about the ascension, and the, or the divin- you come to the ascension service. If you want to know what we think about the divinization of man, come to the Feast of the Holy Transfiguration on August 6th, because that's, our, that's, that's where you're going to really find the content. If you want to know what we think about marriage, come to a marriage service. Uh, if you want to know what we think about baptism, come to baptism and listen. So our, our tradition is expressed in all of these ways, also in the lives of the saints, of course, in the sacred arts like architecture and iconography and music, uh, also in the writings of the Holy Fathers, also in the creed, also in the definitions, the dogmatic decrees of the ecumenical councils. All of these ways uh, we find what, what Christians think and how we live, what we call tradition. It's all expressed that way. So we would not set tradition against scripture. We think that's a false dichotomy. Tradition itself is the umbrella under which scripture is. You can't understand scripture except from within the tradition. Scripture is produced. It didn't drop from God in a package with a nice little bow on it. It was actually written by members of the church in the church over time and then affirmed against literature that was uh in many different categories, some outright outrageously heretical, others important but not scriptural. Uh, in origin, or, or rather Eusebius in his uh, church history describes the standards by which the church fathers uh, were able to discern what was scriptural and what wasn't. It wasn't just obvious. Mm. Uh, so the Bible is very much a, in the consciousness of the church, a work of the Holy Spirit in the church and a part of our inner life. So uh, that's what we think about the, the concept of tradition itself. For us, it's, it's precious. Unfortunately, many Protestants have a negative attitude towards tradition. One of the reasons is because tradition has been uh, improperly castigated, even in Bible translations. So when I was young, the most popular evangelical Bible translation was the New International Version. Yeah. The New International Version... Um, did, did a terrible thing. It, 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 instead of just being authentic, an authentic translation, it really allowed Protestant theology to interpret uh, what was being said, said in the sacred text of Scripture. For example, in the New Testament, paradosis, tradition, is actually used two ways. It's used both positively as holy tradition from God that Christians are required to stand fast in and hold to for their salvation. And it's also used in the negative sense 
for instance, when Jesus was castigating the Pharisees and saying, uh, you hold to the traditions of men and by so doing nullify the word of God. Uh, speaking about their traditions with dedicating things to God, making them korban so that they could not use their money to support their parents or washing their hands and before eating, etc. Uh, Jesus called these things traditions of men. Well, the word is both is in both cases is paradosis, uh, but the translators of the NIV translated all of the positive references of paradosis as teaching, not as tradition, and all of the negative references as tradition. So any innocent evangelical using that Bible, and we can't count how many millions have used it as their core devotional book, are going to naturally think tradition is evil because in their translation, it's only used negatively. When in fact, we have a word in the Greek language, didaki, which means teaching. So mm -hmm. teaching is not the appropriate word for paradosis. And to, to use it that way is uh, very uh, dishonest, very dishonest. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, would you, you like me that. to say? Would you like me to say anything about sola scriptura? If you'd like, yeah. You you mentioned I think it's the heresy that begets the other Protestant heresies. If I'm that might be a slight misquote, but yeah, maybe uh, speak on that for a second. You know, I think most Protestants who enthusiastically champion sola scriptura are doing it, are doing it from piety. What mm -hmm. they're trying to say is that. These words are from God, and we trust them 100%. Uh, that is, in fact, not what sola scriptura means. Uh, that is the orthodox mind <laughs> and the Catholic mind, uh, as well as the Protestant mind. The, no one's questioning the preciousness and the centrality of Holy Scripture. There was a time in the Roman Catholic world where the church discouraged believers from reading the scriptures. That is true. Uh, and the Protestants are right to criticize that. Although the opposite idea, that everyone should read it and think that it's perspicuous, which is a Protestant doctrine that means that perspicari in Latin means to be able to see through, to be, you know, translucent. It, it, the idea that scripture is just going to make itself obvious to people who read it is not the case. Uh, so Orthodox Christians are very aware that we need to read scripture, but we need to read it in accordance with the way that the church has understood it. Sola Scriptura, on, in its formal definition, is saying that the, the scriptures hold a unique authority and uh, are the only authority to which we can appeal for establishing dogma. And we would just say that that is nowhere taught uh, in scripture. As a matter of fact, scripture itself says it's not sola. For instance, St. Paul, who was the spiritual father of the church in the city of Thessaloniki, which, by the way, to this day is a very vibrant church. I mean, I was once, when I was a, a New Orthodox priest, I was in Greece, and I was celebrating the liturgy uh, with a very esteemed older priest. And we were at uh, one of the ancient churches in Thessaloniki, and I noticed that the bishop's throne behind the altar, there's always on the eastern wall, uh, what's called a synthronon, a, 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 a throne that's with the altar where the bishop okay. would stand at certain parts, like during the gospel reading, for instance. And I noticed that in that throne, it was roped off, and it had an icon of St. Paul sitting on the, on the seat of the throne. And I asked him, I said, why is your, your throne, your bishop's throne, roped off, and why is St. Paul there? He said, oh, our bishop would never sit on that. I said, it's his throne. I mean, what are you talking about? He goes, no, no, that's the rostrum from which Paul preached in downtown Thessaloniki in the first century. Wow, <laughs> two thousand years later, right? It's it's roped off with his icon on it because, uh, and now I understood why no bishop wanted yeah. to stand on it. Right? Uh, I got it. But when when Paul was was teaching that, he he spent months and months and months with that church, teaching them every day. And he wrote to them two letters, which are in the New Testament, right? First and Second Thessalonians. And he said in those letters, he said that to stand fast and to hold to the teaching that I delivered to you, either by writing, or by word of mouth. So now imagine that you were uh, a Christian in that church, and that St. Paul was your spiritual father. He had baptized you. He had taught you the faith. Uh, and, he, and you had spent a year every day listening to his teachings because he was trying to establish you. He left you two measly letters, <laughs> eight chapters, right? That compared to what you would have heard for a year of daily teaching, 
Are we supposed to think that the moment he died at the hands of Nero in Rome, all of the Thessalonian Christians said everything he taught us before is now only possible? Uh, the only things we have to obey are the things that are written in the letters. I mean, of course, on its surface, it's just beyond ridiculous. That's just not how it works. But there was no one in the church who thought that the apostolic teaching, which is the authority, but which comes in two ways, both through oral instruction and through writing, that's the authority. What you heard from the mouths of the apostles is what's inspired. That's why the scripture is scripture, because it actually comes from the mouth of the apostles. And this is the orthodox mind, the idea that, that the written portion of the apostolic teaching could be set apart by itself outside of the context of the oral uh, is not feasible. And so the follow-up on that would be that, and the corollary is, so we see it in scripture, but then that tradition is lived out in the church. It's passed on through apostolic succession or just like the life yes. of the church in general? Yes, and, and that doesn't mean everything is apostolic tradition, uh, mm -hmm. but there are many things that are. So, for instance, St. Basil the Great, in his famous work on the Holy Spirit, he describes aspects of holy apostolic tradition that were never codified in Scripture, but that the Church has never questioned. Uh, one of those is the making of the sign of the cross. Another one is praying towards the east. Another is baptizing by trine immersion and immersion in the name of the Holy Trinity. So th those are three clear aspects of apostolic tradition that are universal and have been done by the church in all places throughout her history that St. Basil says are just as authoritative as anything found in scripture. Wow, thank you. There's there's so much I would love to talk about, but I, I do wanna make sure we respect your time. I think it, it would be remiss as a Protestant to not at least ask this question because it really is at the center of the Protestant faith. and I. I think it's the question most evangelicals would ask is so like this all they might be tracking with all of this but they might have this question of okay so at the core and again this is evangelicals are fixated on this how are you saved in the orthodox church what what is that concept of salvation well that's a wonderful and extremely important question that when saint peter was preaching on the day of pentecost he was asked that very question, what should we do to be saved? And he gave a very clear answer. Repent and be baptized and wash away your sins. So uh, an Orthodox Christian would simply say that we need saving. Uh, by the way, just to say that is to set ourselves apart from our current secular context radically. Yeah. Right? We believe in the fallenness of this, this life, that the world is fallen and is falling. We also believe that only one has conquered our enemies, real tangible enemies, death, Satan, the devils, and sin. Christ is the vanquisher and our champion who has conquered all of our enemies, and the way that we're saved from them is by putting our faith, repenting of our sins, and putting our faith in Christ, and being joined to him in holy baptism. This is why St. Peter in 1 Peter 3 says four very important words, baptism, now saves you. Four very important words. Uh, and that's simply because baptism is the means of connecting people to Christ. It's the means by which Jesus has appointed people to be joined to him. We're not denying that he's the Savior. but He is the Savior, but he is the one who defines how someone is joined to him and how someone is saved. And it's not just by a prayer on your pillow in your room, which mystically connects you to him and seals the deal. And now you are... Uh, regenerated and born again through that experience completely apart from the church. That's uh, made up. That's nowhere in Scripture. You are born again, but that born again experience takes place in holy baptism by Jesus' appointment. He said, no one who isn't born of water and the Spirit can see or enter into the kingdom of God. Yes, thank you. That, that was a great answer. And again, I'll just plug the book one more time. This is something you talk about here, and you also talk about the three tenses of saved being used in the New Testament. But Father Josiah, thank you so much for your time. I, I could do this all day, but I know you're a very busy man, and I'm sure people have so much to chew on just from this alone. So thank you so much. Perhaps we can do it again sometime. But I'd like for you to just close out by letting people know where they can find your work, as well as any resources you might recommend if people are watching this and they're interested about the Orthodox Church. 
Well, let me say, Austin, to be with you on Gospel Simplicity has been a great honor. I thank you very much for having me. And uh, I, if anyone would like to interact with me more, uh, you can do so by going to our website at patristicnectar.org. There you'll find uh, a collection under many thematic heads of uh, all sorts of theological lectures, expositions of scripture, etc. You can also find us on YouTube at Patristic Nectar Films. Either of those channels will allow you to be uh, in contact with myself and with uh, my company. Awesome. Well, Father Josiah, thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy. And thanks to all of you for watching this. And a special shout out to my patron subscribers and merch buyers who make things like this possible. Until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world.